Does marketing work? <laughs> I think so. Even better, today's guest knows so. He's infinitely smarter than me, having done a bucket load of research dating back to 79 AD to prove his point. It's a very historical and intellectual episode 466 of the award-winning small business big marketing show, thanks to American Express. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing opulence. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner, ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. Today's episode 466 is made possible thanks to the good folk at American Express Business Cards, which are designed for business owners just like you. A little bit more about them later on in the show. Speaking of show, very big one today. We meet author and cubicle escapee, love a cubicle escapee, Jeff Swiston, who's written a very clever book titled Why Marketing Works. We hear from another author in Steve Sims. He's written a very good book called Blue Fishing, The Art of Getting Things Done, who's got another way to wow those precious clients of yours. And whilst on the topic of authors, a well-read listener shares how this show has changed his life and, as a result, wins lots of prizes. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. I can't hear you. Oh, wow. Wow. Did someone say something? That, my friends, is a clear sign that it's time to get wowed, thanks to our great mates at American Express, whose business card programs also make the smart business owner go wow. As usual, all the way from California, IA, we're joined by Captain Wow himself, Steve Sims, who's also the founder of The Bluefish, LA's leading concierge service, whose clients include Elton John. I was going to say the piano man, but that's Billy Joel. So he knows a thing or two about the wow. Steve, you ready to drop another wow bomb in our laps this week? Oh, I'm ready for you, pal. Well, I, we don't need to talk about Elton John. I was going to ask, but we've already done an episode about how you got Elton John as a client. So I'll put that link in the show notes. What's your tip this week? I want people to get selfish. I remember as we grew up and as a kid, my mum would often kind of like grab me when I was you know, playing with, you know, playing in a playground where I had sweets. And she would always go, oh, don't be selfish, don't be selfish. Don't. And you grew up thinking that this word selfish was a bad thing. Now, I'm here to tell you that you should revere it, you should respect it, you should honor it, and you should put the word selfish on a pedestal and look up to it. Because you ain't getting any younger, as with, with wonderful podcasts like this, and thanks to you and thanks to MX for doing it, we're getting smarter. Mm-hmm. So we need to get selfish with our time and how we disperse what we know to help other people. So I want you to start valuing what you own, what you have inside you. And when you're dealing with a client, be selfish about your time. Be selfish about your knowledge and go, hey, I really want to help you. Do I have your attention? Mm. Are you there? Are you engrossed in this moment? Are you immersed in allowing me to help you better X, Y, Z? I want you to start respecting your time and bluntly, I want you to become more selfish with your knowledge. And I wonder whether too, being selfish, uh, it sort of sounds negative when you say it, but I I get what you're saying. Um, You also create scarcity. And when something's scarce, people want more of it? Absolutely, 100%. And if you just, what will happen is those people that you don't have the attention of, they may actually be offended by your directness Mm -hmm. and by your, again, selfishness with what you know, and they may run to the sides. And that's fantastic because when the bad people go away, the good people get in. 
And that's what we want. We want more of the right people, not a million of the wrong people. Isn't that interesting? Uh, one of the great things about the power of marketing is that it attracts the right kind of people into your business. I think there's too many business owners, potentially listening maybe, who cast a very wide net and will take on anyone. You know, any client's a good client. And I'm not sure that's the case. So being selfish mm. is going to help them self-select. Yeah, no, you're totally right. That's actually, uh, you know, not all clients are good. <laughs> no, a bad client can bring a business down. Yeah, it's a cancer. It, yeah. a, a picking, having a client come in, I, I know it's years ago, if you if you focus on the clients that come through the door, you remove 99% of the problems because bad clients do not get better with time. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. In fact, uh, uh, an interview I did, gee, I reckon it was about seven years ago, was with a dentist, Paddy Lund, and he got very, very selfish. He, uh, in fact, he, he got to the point where he was looking at ending his life and he was that depressed. He decided to have a really hard look at himself, the way he treated his staff and his business, his clients. Long story short, and I'll, again, I'll put a link in the show notes to this interview. He got so selfish, Steve, that he sacked 75% of his clients. The 25% that remained, he gave two business cards to and said, if you know people like you that need a dentist, please give them my card. And uh, his business, he never, ever looked back. His business boomed after that. Exactly. That's there the best way to do it. Well, I did a similar kind of thing. You fire your clients and be proud to do so. <laughs> Love it. All right, buddy. Well, there you go. Thanks to American Express. That is another killer way to make your precious clients go wow. To find out how American Express can add a little wow to your business, Google Amex Business after the show. Simsy, it's been an absolute pleasure. See you next time. Ta-ta for now. Oh, I do love the WOW segment, and so do you, from what I can tell. Thanks for all the emails saying how much you are enjoying Simsy's tips. They're good, aren't they? Not the email. Well, the emails are good. So are Simsy's tips. And, and some of you have actually asked where to buy his book, which is called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. Two places. Head over to Amazon, or you can head over to Simsy's website, Steve D. Sims, one M. Dot com. And another thank you. Thanks for the 469 of you that have so far left a five-star review on the Australian iTunes store. Really, really appreciate it. I know on other stores around the world, the American store, the UK store, New Zealand, there is hundreds of reviews there as well. So thank you so much. It means a lot. It boosts my rankings and boosts my ego. So we've got to love that. And it's never too late to leave a review. So go on, go and do it after the show or put it on pause and come back. Now, let's meet today's special guest, Jeff Swiston, who in a previous life was the chief marketing officer, that's the CMO at Interbrand, which is a rather large uh, global branding agency. And he was also the chief communications officer at DDB Worldwide, which is a rather large advertising agency, global advertising agency. He then saw the light as did I many years ago. He escaped the cubicle, the advertising cubicle, and went out on his own to become a consulting chief marketing officer to brands who want to lead. But where it gets really interesting is Jeff has just released a book called Why Marketing Works, in which he identifies through a mountain of his own roll-up-the-sleeves research seven timeless principles that well and truly prove his thesis. Rest assured, His seven principles apply to businesses of all sizes, all industries, and all types of business. Whether you're selling business to business, B2B, B2C, or my favorite, P2P, people to people. I started off by asking Jeff for his definition of marketing. That is a great place to start. Uh, And I actually think marketing umbrellas, all those other things out there, when we like when we talk about branding brands and advertising to me, marketing is the umbrella for uh, all of these sort of communications. Marketing to me is the creation of a relationship uh, that uh, allows people to get good information, possibly in entertaining ways, and just allows them to make a, a better purchase decision. Yeah, yeah, a nice definition. I, I often think some people have a very, very broad definition of marketing, and some business owners that I speak to have such a, a very narrow definition. I mean, it's amazing still how many think marketing equals advertising. 
Yeah, and that's good on forever, you know, and, and uh, we used to laugh uh, when I was in advertising or at the brand consultancy uh, Interbrand. Uh, if you could describe what you did in marketing to your mother and she got it, then you were doing well. Because uh, <laughs> half the time they will revert, audiences will revert to this notion of advertising because everyone's most familiar with it. Yeah, that, that's one misconception. What other misconceptions do you see out there as you go around speaking to business owners large and small about marketing? I think there's two things that go on. One uh, is really dangerous, um, is that marketing in certain clients, certain brands, certain businesses, is it's tactics in search of a strategy. Uh, you know, uh, business owners say, you know, we just need a Facebook page. Um, mm. We need a video on the, on the homepage of our website. You know, all those things may be true. Uh, those are great tactics. But if you don't have a defined strategy and creative execution of it, all you're doing is sort of throwing dollars away and, and doing uh, busy work. That's something that I'm seeing a lot of these days. And then I see too much reliance on um, all the marketing tech that's at our fingertips now, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. You know, there's stuff coming out all the time. But once again, a social media strategy, programmatic ad buys, uh, AI, all of these things, they're fantastic. But once again, if you don't have something interesting, relevant, and different to say, and say it in a compelling, emotional way, um, you're going to fail. I see so many business owners, Jeff, uh, racing to that idea of the tactics. Get a Facebook page, get a website, you know, get a keynote ready to give it a Chamber of Commerce event, which is all fantastic. Uh, but they forget there's a whole lot of other work to be done prior to that in terms of it's sort of message versus medium. Like they race to the medium and forget that, oh, hang on, there's a message. What are you going to say? What are you going to say on that website or on that Facebook page? So um, I know that you cover that off in one of your seven principles, which we'll talk about soon. So Jeff, this, this book you've written, Why Marketing Works, I love the title, Seven Time-Tested Brand Building Principles. Where did the idea come from? You know, it's interesting, uh, given your audience is, um, I'm sure it's a, a range of businesses, but you're focused on small. Um, so I'm a Canadian. I live uh, north of Montreal in Quebec uh, at a ski resort, actually. So I'm, I'm very much the stereotypical Canadian now. <laughs> I have worked in the big cities, but now we're in this small market and I travel around. But one summer, about four or five summers ago, my wife and I went to the local farmer's market. And actually, that visit was the catalyst for this book. I, I thought there was a book in me from my days on Madison Avenue. But when I saw um, these vendors, you know, at various stalls uh, set up on a municipal government parking lot, uh, selling everything from interesting baked goods like ornate looking pies to the, you know, the meat purveyor that had, uh, you know, had all these great slabs of beef, pork, you know, chicken mm. uh, to artisans who were selling, you know, interesting wares. And I, I just watched the bartering going on. And I thought, wow, this is not really changed from everything we've seen in, you know, old movies. This is how they used to do it in Rome. Uh, this is how they used to do it in Pompeii. And it got me thinking, has marketing really changed through the years? And is there some consistency and continuity to the practice? So I went back, uh, you know, a good two, 300 years, wherever I could find something really interesting and began cobbling together marketing's history. And from that, the seven principles fell out. There is this remarkable consistency to successful marketing, and they're represented in the seven principles in the book. Did you expect that result? Not at all. Quite frankly, I, I'm just a fan of history. So I thought maybe I'll write kind of, you know, uh, the history of marketing, which would have been daunting unto itself. But I started grabbing these nuggets and they kind of fell into line all on their own. And I have to give credit to my publishers and editors. They sort of pushed me in this direction too, not to simplify things. I'm not a big fan of, you know, how to's and checklists and things like that. So, you know, I want to emphasize to your listeners you don't do these seven things as a checklist. There are things that are happening all the time and you've got to keep your eye on all of them. It's uh, interesting how they interrelate, um, but they're not do this thing and then do this thing and then do the next thing. Um, they're the elements that make up a great marketing strategy and plan. I digress for one moment, but not being a big fan of how-tos and checklists, we have become a bit of a how-to and checklist society. It's sort of the, they're the clickbait of the internet, aren't they? If you see a... Oh my God, you, you, <laughs> you've hit something. I, you know, you and I could probably have 10 pints over this one, but it's uh, it really bothers me because I do wake up and I do my, you know, sort of go to the, my favorite sites and news sources and, and apps. 
and you know the seven ways to yes. do this the 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 six things of that so i actually fought with my publishers about you know putting that seven brand br- brand yes. building principles right on the cover uh, but the fact of the matter is I, I've proven them. They're there. Uh, they make sense. And um, they're a lot of fun because I, I, I really grab some anecdotes. You know, we're all sick as marketers and business owners sort of hearing about the same brands over and over mm-hmm. again. You know, how much can you hear about Apple, McDonald's, Coke? Um, you know, they're all re- relevant. That They're all fantastic, great brands, and they do marketing very well. Um, but uh, I found some really obscure stories that are just fun to read. Uh, but then also have great lessons behind them. Well, see, I love that. I love the fact that you have focused on the more obscure. And I try to do that with this show whilst I have interviewed the founders and owners of some large brands. I mean, the spirit of this show and clearly of your book is small business, big marketing. And we live in a world today that allows us to do that. You grew up on Madison Avenue. I grew up on Little St Kilda Road, which is the advertising equivalent in in Melbourne, Australia. And, um, you know, it was all about the big brands. But these days, the marketing world's changed so much. And uh, we can do uh, incredible things as small business owners with marketing and building great brands. So to that end, young Jeff Swiston, let's get stuck into these. Um, let's get stuck into these seven time-tested brand building principles. And you lead with number one. Yeah, this was an interesting one, and it seems uh, when you read the whole list, it seems like, ooh, does that one really fit? But when I look back through the years, the most successful uh, stories, uh, marketing stories, were. We're positioning the brand, the product, the service as a solution, something to make people's lives easier, more enjoyable. Uh, And there's some great stories in this one. I I love the story of just the Gillette razor starting and how in the first year, the gentleman's name, by the way, was King Camp Gillette, quite a name. Um, So Mr. Gillette uh, in his first year, you know, he had this new system back then. You know, you had to sharpen your straight razor and go through all that uh, uh, effort uh, for a daily shave, and he created, you know, the stamped blade that fit into this thing. Um, and the first year, he sold like maybe seventy nine razors and one hundred and twenty four blades. Ouch! The, the next year, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but the numbers in the book, it was literally like seventy thousand uh, of the razors and one hundred and forty thousand blades. And what he did, in the difference there is, he, he sort of asked himself, you know, I've got this tremendous product. It's it obviously is groundbreaking. Why aren't people getting it? So he actually. Um, began positioning through advertising in magazines, wherever he could distribute and afford, uh, that this was a time saver. Um, It was better for hygiene. And I would love this. It was a path to professional success for a gentleman. If you were well-groomed, you had a greater chance of acing that interview, getting a job, getting that promotion. So um, that was positioning the product as a solution rather just uh, as a alternative uh, to the other way of shaving. Well, and uh, great learning, offering benefits versus features uh, is probably the same thing as offering a solution, isn't it? Like, what is it, what's in it for me? That's the society we live in. Yeah, absolutely, and you've probably you know worked kind of from the same period uh, pyramid graphic um, when we look at whatever it is you are offering. There's the fundamental uh, functional benefits it, it provides. There's some emotional benefits that next bandwidth, mm. and then the top of the pyramid is the higher order benefits, you know, and that really is even farther than um, what's in it for me. It's really, how is this going to change my life for the better? And if you can craft a story, craft a message around that, um, you're going to move blades, obviously. Totally. And there's a great tip around turning a feature into a benefit, which is a little copywriting tip that I learned years ago, which is when you uh, you, you use the words, which means. So if, if a car is, um, for example, uh, the car is red, which means it goes a lot faster. You know, that's, that's a very simple yeah. example, which is completely untrue, of course. Um, there must be a reason all Ferraris are red, most Ferraris are red, but um, turning a feature into a benefit is, is golden and working in solutions because we all want a solution. I love the fact that you chose Gillette, despite the fact that we said there's no Nikes, Mac, McDonald's or <laughs> or Apple's yeah. legend in the well, book. And, and, but I'm, I'm telling the story from his first year of business. So he was a small businessman yes. that grew this into, you know, as we know today, such a, a tremendous brand brand that has so many uh, offshoots to it. And, and, and to your point, too, about that, um, if you can change that, just 
change that story a bit. And I, I love the line from the mattress in, industry is you don't sell the mattress, you sell the sleep. Yes. And that's just a tremendous way that I think all of your listeners should think about their business, whatever it is, their marketing and selling. Um, don't sell the product, sell the benefit, sell that higher order benefit. And uh, you're going to have far more conversations and far more customers. And so inspirational, as you say, King, what was his name? King Camp Gillette. King Camp. Yeah, like uh, yeah, C-A-M-P. Um, and was a small business owner once, you know. He was selling 79 razors in the first year. That's crazy. And now it's the biggest the blade in the world. So um, great story. Jeff, what's, um, what's the next marketing principle number two? Well, and you know, there's been a lot of debate about this one, but I just, you know, to me, I, I adhere to it. I just can't see other any other way of communicating um, uh, a, a brand, but that's through telling stories. You know, uh, s- stories are the currency of, of humankind. Um, uh, there's that old proverb, you know, if you, you you can you can talk about facts and figures, and people won't remember them. You can show people stuff, and they'll kind of. But if you if you phrase it in a story. People are able to take that away. And mm. I just think when you go to like a cocktail party this coming weekend, what's the first thing that's, you know, someone new is going to ask you, what do you do for a what living? You or, do? you know, what, what, what do you like? You end up telling a story. Stories mm. are, are, are everything. And in this particular chapter, and it's around the same time of uh, Gillette, um, I talk about Odor Oh No. Uh, which was the first uh, sort of perspiration brand that came out. And believe it or not, again, a very small uh, business at the start and a very young business owner, a 17-year-old girl uh, named, named Edna Murphy, um, saw that her surgeon dad was using some sort of solution to keep his hands dry during surgery. And she turned it into really the first perspiration brand. And she failed uh, too, kind of like King Camp. Went out there, sold it on medicinal benefits, and um, ended up hiring J. Walter Thompson and the gentleman who would go on to uh, lead J. Walter Thompson worldwide, that agency. Uh, And he turned the story more to a social um, faux pas, that if you were exuding a (laughs) un- happy smell uh, in society at parties, then you are not going to rise, uh, you know, within your social circles. And interestingly enough, this was originally pitched, um, odor or no, to men. He said, no, the target market is women. And he kept pushing on that. And initially, they were really insulted. He was taking out ads and um, some pretty uh, well-known magazines back in America at the time, uh, Good Housekeeping and things like that. And actually, there was a huge backlash by women saying, you know, this is an insult to us. But sales climbed in in similar um, scale to the Gillette Blade story. And so he really hit upon something. And his ads are absolutely beautiful. The one-page ads, he writes these long, they must be, I don't know, 800 word copy ads back then because people had patience for it. They weren't as bombarded as we are today. And and they were like um, stories of how to be uh, uh, a successful woman, how to be uh, an important woman, how to be a woman with social cachet. Right, nice. The the day of the long copy ad is well and truly gone. Although you could argue that when everyone else is shouting, it's time to whisper. And the whispering would be a long copy ad. But um, even ads these days are kind of dead in that form, aren't they? Well, you know, I I still, uh, to me, um, even the most complex brief that uh, an advertising agency or consultant would get um, should be able to be explained in uh, a few words in a, uh, in a word document. You shouldn't yes. need to go to PowerPoint right away to get your point across. You shouldn't be, you know, having to do visuals or video. You should be able to solve the problem in a few words. And that's why I still think uh, when I see a, a gorgeous print ad, whether it's long or short copy, I'm still really excited by that because someone's done some smart thinking. Jeff, the two principles that you've shared so far, position your offer as a solution and tell stories, I totally agree with them both. They raise the anxiety that many small business owners have around copywriting. Probably they don't even know, some of them don't even know they have the anxiety, but they're, they're having to write their own copy, their own web copy, their own ad copy, their own sales letter copy. And as you and I know, copy is just so important. And I wonder whether you have a solution to this because copywriters aren't cheap. Not every small business owner can necessarily afford a copywriter, although they all seem to have a graphic designer on their team. Any tips there? 
Yeah, no, it is. You've, you've hit a real conundrum and it is a tough one. I'm actually engaged with a client right now, um, a 140 location sweet treat uh, franchisee model. And, you know, that sounds like a significant business. And, you know, they're taking in franchise fees every month. They're selling this product called a beaver tail. It's a Canadian product. Um, a, not a real sugary beaver. stamped well, doughy not, thing. Not a meaty um, beaver tail. As in, a, like a, it's it's a sugar, it's a candy. It's a it's a candy Good. treat that you can put a ton of different toppings on, and you know this is a fabulous business. Um, but they themselves, uh, when I first gave my fee for writing their uh, revamped brand story, you know it was a tough number for them, mm. and so we've been working together because it's a fun project, and so. I know that regardless of, you know, who you go to engage and, you know, a, a expensive person or, you know, a, a junior right out of school is writing copy on their Mac out of the basement, um, it still is a price tag. But the fact of the matter is the only reason for a business owner, small, medium or large to go outside is because you don't have that expertise in house. And also the objectivity to your brand, to your business mm you're paying that's what you're paying for because you know on a day-to-day -day, um scale small business owners are doing everything you know from accounts receivable to payable to employee training to whatever it is you could have you know three um florist shops and you could be run ragged right um mm. so who has time to sit down and, and really do this so as expensive as it may be as distracting as, as it may be which it's, it really isn't to the core business um i just believe it's an investment that must be made money well spent jeff swinston number three marketing principle number three yeah, definitely. This is uh, in the studies uh, I reference in this chapter. It's all about emotion. Um, you know, as we said at the top of the call, marketing is about giving information that allows consumers to make a better, more informed decision. Uh, and as we've seen through the last 50, 70 years, uh, that information can be conveyed in a number of ways. Um the insurance industry is one I bring up. Uh, it's, I watch the American insurance industry, and I'm fascinated by it because we're a little bit more conservative in Canada, and we sort of get it. But they've created like six different spokespeople across six different companies. They're they're kind of like um, uh, icons, like Ronald McDonald. Like they have okay. a character called Mayhem. They have a professor. Uh, these are the big insurance companies, so they've had a hard time. Um, telling their story because if you remember early days of insurance the whole purpose of marketing was to scare the crap out of people mm -hmm. to buy more insurance you know you need home auto life uh personal collision all that stuff and that didn't work for them after a time we they sort of threatened consumers away so now these big big insurance companies in the u.s have created sort of cuddly icons and mascots um that talk irreverently about the need for insurance. Um, it's not the greatest example for success because I think they're just fighting over little bits of market share. But it's interesting. They moved from scare tactics, a certain emotion around that or threatening, to one which is more humorous, more irreverent to bring people in. And hopefully when they got people in, they can tell their story. Um, so that's an interesting one. That's not the greatest example. But what I really like is the, um, you know, the Unilever campaign, you know, the, the, the real beauty campaign that won all the awards like five, six, seven years ago. Um, so I talk about that in the book. It, it was about moving away from society's uh, take on what a woman should look like. And in, all of a sudden in Unilever's um, campaigns, they started showing real women mm -hmm. in their underwear. They started showing you know, people of all shapes and sizes talking about their body image issues. And this was really amazing for a company that is selling beauty products, which has all been about, you know, covering women's faces up in some regard. Mm -hmm. Now it was about stripping things away and really talking about uh, society's notion of what it is to be a beautiful person. And that was a hugely emotional story and, and won lots of people over, and it was reflected in their results. So the principle here, Jeff, is about injecting emotion into your marketing and avoiding and staying away from the rational, which kind of plays back into offering up solutions, telling stories, all, all that is emotion. And in fact, the best definition I've heard of a brand is it's an emotional connection. So 
I, I get it. The more we can inject, you know, using I, I, only yesterday, I was actually reading about how Ronald McDonald, the clown, came into being. You know, because up until then, McDonald's was selling on price; they were fifteen cent hamburgers. Um, and then one of the franchisees from Chicago area came into head office and said, "I've been using this clown, and every time I bring him out, our sales quadruple." And so it's sort of going from that irrational to to that emotional kind of aspect of your business. Yeah. And, and those, you know, I don't want to say they're gimmicky. They're great. They work. They, they draw people in. They give you, you know, because there's just so much communication clutter out there. So, uh, yeah, the, really the point of the chapter, and you hit on it well, Timbo, it's about um, connecting with people as quick as possible because we all have um, very limited attention spans these days. Yeah. And when you talked about uh, that emotional connection, if you don't mind, I'll move to the next chapter because sure. it's a great segue. Um, and that next chapter is about building relationships. So if you've already gone out with emotion, the idea is you put yourself out there in some way. And now the uh, hope is that you can build a, a longstanding relationship with the consumer. I actually kick off this chapter with a, a quote from Beth Comstock, who was huge at General Electric, and she's now vice chair. She says, we are all emotional beings looking for relevance, context and connection. And it's so true. Uh, we want to join uh, neat groups. We want, you know, we're tribal by nature. Mm. So this whole uh, next chapter on relationships for your uh, listeners, it's about seeing how you can create um, a really neat relationship with your consumers that they want to keep coming back to you because you're satisfying something uh, for them. Not a solution, perhaps, but a validation that they're making the right choice. Got an example of a business that's done that well? Yeah, so really, this obscure one has been hilarious. So um, if you read the reviews on Amazon of my book, uh, two or three of the reviewers have actually brought this one out. I'm not sure if uh, Down Under you guys had a, a treat called After Eight Mints. Um, it was a, a round tree uh, product out of England, so it found its way to Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, the name uh, was deliberate after eight minutes. You're going to have them after your dinner. And so it was instructive. It was teaching the Brits who had come out of austerity measures following World War II. This is around 1960. They were starting to get their economy back in, on track after uh, being nearly bankrupted by World War II. And people weren't entertaining at that point. They didn't have the money to do so. But now there was new wealth and they started entertaining. So these after eight minutes came out and said, have a box of these on the table. They're um, sophisticated. They'll show that you're a great host. Um, and uh, uh, people started putting them out. And it was absolutely incredible. They gravitated to Canada. I remember my parents having them. So the After Eight story was great for a time. And then all of a sudden, their sales started to slide again. <laughs> and they looked at it and said, well, it's because we're telling people you only have a box after eight. And then all of their advertising switched in two different directions. First off, enjoy it throughout the day, and they did some really illustrative, fun campaigns with that. Second, they said, if you're going to be a guest at such a dinner function, you should bring a box of After Eight Mints to the host and hostess. They shouldn't only just provide it. So the next thing you know, they have three or four times the sales. Um, but what I love about the After Eights story, because they still sell today, we're you know, 50, 60 years on, is that they've gone through a cycle of marketing where um, they poke fun at themselves. There's an irreverence around these uh, wafer thin mints that come in their own little pouches. Uh, they poke fun at themselves, but they've built relationships with their audiences that have lasted now from one generation to the other because we have a certain nostalgia for it. Mm. And, you know, you take that into the modern day, Jeff, and, and the building of relationships online is now infinitely easier. Where, and it's two way because of social media, because of email marketing, because of, you know, lead capture on websites, all that kind of stuff. And the smart business owners out there, and I know there are many listening, um, have that ongoing conversation. We've talked um, at length about this on the show previously where on your website, is it, if you're a locksmith or a chiropractor or, or a solicitor, um, people are going to go to your website once, maybe twice. So therefore, at, at, as soon as they get there, offer them something in return for their email address so that you can have an ongoing relationship with them and offer, offer them things of value on an ongoing basis because one day they might need you. Absolutely. No, that's, that's so good. And I, we, I wanted to mention it earlier in the call when we were talking about tactics versus strategy. You know what the fact is? 
you need a lot of tactics. So I, I don't want to dissuade any of the small business mm -hmm. listeners from, you know, trying different things. Marketing is uh, uh, both an experiment and I'd like to say a furious plagiarism, you know, take ideas from somewhere else and try to graft them on because they can work. I, I worked with a company that did a study. Um, this is about 15 years ago that said a customer uh, needs set, uh, a potential customer needs 17 touches before they will be predisposed to buy what you are offering. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. So we, you know, we have to have a smart strategy. We've got to tell a great story. We've got to talk about our difference and the higher order benefits uh, for our customers. But the fact is, then you do have to get that message out there. And as that study showed, you've got to get it out there in a lot of different ways, whether it be a newsletter, um, couponing, uh, loyalty program, uh, website outreach, all those things, because um, that just continues to amaze me, that number, 17 touches Amazing. before a customer will feel good about trying you. How's your cash flow management going? <laughs> it's certainly not my strong suit. For the first few years of business, I thought my accountant told me to spend more than I earned. Got that wrong, didn't I? Fortunately, American Express business cards are built specifically with business owners just like you and I in mind. Their cards can be used to pay for everyday business purchases, helping you manage your business's cash flow whilst earning rewards along the way. Both their credit and charge cards provide up to 51 days interest-free, reward points that you can convert to travel, gift cards, or pay down the balance on your card. Plus, some of their cards are tailored for you to earn Qantas or Virgin Australia points directly. Gotta love that. We all need a bit of a holiday, I reckon. To find out more and get your cash flow under control, Google Amex Business after the show. Thanks to American Express, we're chatting with Jeff Swiston, who's the author of the Amazon bestseller, Why Marketing Works, Seven Time-Tested Brand Building Principles. Jeff, we're up to principle number five. Yes, I hope I'm not testing your patience with all not seven, at all, but mate. here we go. <laughs> so we've moved from relationships now so that, you know, that was sort of the one-on-one. -on -one. How do you get, how do you generate that relationship? And then it's about building community around your brand, getting those like-minded people that are enjoying what you offer, whether it's a service product or, or other, uh, to, to build a community. And, and I give lots of examples here, both from present day uh, to the past, you know, GoPro, the camera company, they've, they've created a community uh, of um, avant-garde and, and crazy athletes, you know, recording everything they do from the ski slopes to jumping off cliffs. And, and related to that is Red Bull. What a community they have created around an energy drink and, and their activities in order to pull people in. And, and, you know, when you hear Red Bull now, you go, yes, that's a drink that can keep your teenage kids up at night. Mm. But no, it's a uh, sports and entertainment business that has created a community. Uh, and it's, you know, they make as much money off um, uh, their YouTube uh, videos as I think they do off their soft drinks these days. So community is huge. There's, um, it's funny um, to do a relatable story for a small business. So in my community, which is, you know, 5,000 people at any one time, uh, hour and a half north of a big city, but then grows to 15, 20 in ski season. And so all these businesses have up and down periods. And I hear all the stories about the restaurants and the shoulder season and how they're suffering. Um, but, you know, and then they, they're overrun when the tourists come. And I see it firsthand. I think you'll like this story, uh, Timbo. My stepdaughter is living here now and has started up a very successful hot yoga studio. And I have enjoyed watching her build a community around that studio. And if anyone's familiar with yoga, it's a community to begin with. But mm -hmm. then there's these, you know, communities within a community that really band around love. The, they're, they're tied to the instructors who are good. They're tied to the studio that is offering clean facilities and great classes but boy, she has parties and the instructors and the uh, clientele show up. She does events in the community for free yoga for seniors. I've just watched her build this thing and um, she hadn't read my book yet. <laughs> so she was doing it intuitively and instinctively. But it was just really neat to see her, you know, grow this business from 
you know, uh, I won't give numbers, but it's really impressive. And it's because she is focused on a yoga community here in our village. Well, I think there's a number of things there. A, that's a fun thing to do. And we should have said up front, marketing should be fun. I often say marketing should be a hobby uh, because when something's a hobby, you find time for it, you find money to throw at it, you find the resources. Um, secondly, I think as an insight into human beings these days, we're looking for community. We're, we're incredibly, we are an incredibly disconnected race thanks to social media, which you could argue is a great way to build community. And it is, I get that. But I think more and more people are looking to look up and not down at their screens these days. And by looking up, I mean what your, da- your stepdaughter is doing is going to a party, connecting with it, with other uh, members of the yoga community and, and just having fun and eyeballing and, you know, I think that can only be of benefit to any business who really, really adheres to principle number five. You, you know, it, 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 she's reminding me of a quote from uh, good old Henry Ford who said, I like to see how much I can um, give with a dollar instead of get with a dollar. So she's, uh, you know, she's pricing things right. She's protecting her margin. She's doing all that. But she's um, also ex- expending, you know, personal emotional time uh, on making sure people are happy with personal touches like hot cloths at the end or sorry, cold cloths at the end of a hot yoga class on people's faces, which is an additional investment for her, yeah. you know, all these things, but just to give little uh, flares and panaches to, to what she does. So absolutely kudos to her. And I know I heard your sponsor there, American express. And mm-hmm. I talk in this chapter about their small business Saturday that they've done, which I, I really appreciate, which is to direct, uh, uh, consumers in America to the small businesses of that nation Mm -hmm. and uh, how they've actually, you know, uh, achieved like $16.2 billion of sales on that day in 2015, according to the American Express website, because they've been working with uh, their small business partners um, on promoting small businesses. And I love the story of Barack Obama and his family going to a local bookstore in Washington, D.C. while he was still the president uh, and taking the kids for a treat at an ice cream shop in Washington on that day. Uh, just a lovely story. Love it. Love it. Principle number six, Jeff. Yes. And, you know, of course, uh, you said marketing should be fun. And the reason why marketing is fun is it shouldn't be treated as a transaction. Of course, at the end of the day, uh, everyone wants to have a sale. Um, and But now we position things as an experience. And that's how we all differentiate. Um, how does one coffee shop get all the business versus the one Mm -hmm. across the street that isn't doing as well. There must be something in their secret sauce. The, the, uh, the, the, the greeting from the, uh, the staff, uh, the cleanliness of the space, uh, the variety of, of the wares, all that sort of stuff come into it. So as we've been saying, you've probably been saying this for about 20 years too, Timbo, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, experiences are key now. And even with the millennials, we're finding that they're staying away from buying cars. They're not as interested in getting that uh, house and, and starting the family. They're putting their money into experiences, actual travel, uh, participating in sporting events. Uh, so experience is taking on really a life of its own. Absolutely. We all love, again, it all comes back to getting out and about uh, and experiencing things as opposed to just kind of that transactional nature. And it's amazing what how transforming it can be when a business goes from simply being transactional to trans- transformational. If you like, I interviewed a fellow a number of years ago now, Darren Finkelstein. He owns a little boatyard, or he owned a little boatyard down uh, at a local marina. And it was a transactional business, buy, sell, uh, service high-end motorboats. And he went from being transactional to transformational, Jeff, by simply doing a weekly weather report on his YouTube channel, which showed customers and prospects what the weather was doing that upcoming weekend and how it was going to affect his boating. And whilst that's not an experience that um, necessarily the the potential buyer is having, he is still giving them an experience and an emotion that will help them have a great experience on the water. I, I, I love that story. That's fantastic. And, and it's I, I wrote a piece about five years ago about, I think I said it earlier, little flourishes, just little things you can do um, go an absolute long way in – creating experience, creating connection, creating conversations so people go and share that experience, whether online or offline. 
I feel like there's a drum roll needed here. Have you left the best to last? Concept no, <laughs> principle number seven. I, I've 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 left. Uh, let's call it uh, kind of a warning to last, and that is all that you do in marketing, all that you do in communicating your business has to be done with transparency, honesty, and uh, this chapter is around authenticity. Um, Just this last week, I'm not sure if the story uh, was news down there, it was certainly news here, where the North Face, uh, that uh, apparel company, Mm -hmm. you know, for outdoorsy stuff, uh, they ended up getting into some trouble with their ad agency because they went on Wikipedia and swapped out pictures um, on 15 um, geographic sites. So you go to Wikipedia, where's great hiking and, you know, Patagonia or some place comes up and Australia or New Zealand or Ireland, this, these 15 top places to go. Uh, their ad agency actually went there and put promotional uh, North Face photos uh, in the Wikipedia sites. And you think, wow, uh, was that just to gain awareness, just to have people, if they happen to, you know, punch in and go to Wikipedia and that and see North Face? But it was actually also to drive um, their Google statistics. Uh, And so it was completely um, uh, dishonest. Unauthentic. They totally got called on it and they've apologized, but they haven't really, um, you know, signaled what they're going to do as compensation for this action. I wonder about things like that. I mean, at the end of the day, very uh, unauthentic, uh, the wrong thing to do. But was there a secondary meeting at the North Face HQ where they said, this is going to cause us some short-term pain, but we're going to be talked about, we're going to be remembered, we're going to be in the conversation for not the right reasons, but... You know, no one's died as a result of this, and <laughs> and you know our SEO is going to explode and our traffic. I don't know. What do you think? Am I being cynical? I, you know what? I think it's funny that I think we're uh, if you're in this profession uh, long enough, you get a little bit jaded, a little bit cynical, and certainly that was discussed too in follow up reports. And we had a similar issue here. We have a, a successful company out of Canada called Lululemon that is you know one yes. of the bigger. Uh, apparel producers of yoga related fashion back to that yoga thing and about two three years ago or maybe more uh, they came out with a pair of pants that were a little too sheer uh, but sold them and you know then when women were uh, and they were women pants uh, you know were doing yoga moves Mm -hmm. and that there was a little bit too much showing uh, and so the thought was around that too. They had to recall them all. They they compensated the uh, the consumers who bought them, and they literally shredded them uh, to to dispose of them. But everyone at that time thought too, was that just a PR stunt? And you know that makes me doubly sick that you would actually, um, you know, hatch the scheme to have another scheme. You know, it, yes. it, it just makes no sense to me. I've got another one for you: the Starbucks takeaway cup that was accidentally, I put in quotes, found, seen on the most recent uh, airing of Game of Thrones. Did you hear about that? I did. I did. I cannot help. What's your take? My take is that Starbucks paid an absolute large amount of money for that to happen because I just think that's just going to be, that'll go down in marketing history, product placement history. Uh, Or was it put there by accident? I don't think so. You know what? There's just too many people on set to let that flub. Correct. They, they, when they're in the editing process, you would pick that up. You Correct. would think, uh, yeah, no, it's a, uh, it's one that I think uh, we'll probably hear <laughs> in about six months. Uh, the, it's some sort of stunt behind it. Jeff, uh, great principles. I'm just going to reiterate them. Tell me if I've got any wrong. Number one was position your offer as a solution. Number two is tell stories. Number three is connect with people using emotion. Number four is build relationships. Number five is build community around your brand. Number six is don't treat marketing uh, as a transaction but as an experience. And number seven is be authentic. Have I got them all right? Have I passed? Uh, I I, I think you're a co-author. I love it. I love it. Uh, well done. Thank you for contributing to to the marketing story. It is a, it is a little bit of a history of marketing, this book, the uh, Why Marketing Works, Seven Time-Tested Brand Building Principles, which can be found on Amazon and probably all good booksellers. Um, what do you hope, Jeff, just to finish up? Because, we, again, we've talked about um, self-publishing and just publishing a book on this show previously as, a, as an effective marketing tactic for small business owners. What do you personally hope to, to from being an author of a book now? 
Well, it, the first thing I, I got out of it, it was a cathartic exercise. I sort of wrote some stuff out uh, that were um, bugging me and I wanted to get out and uh, tell, you know, get that out of my system. And then I just thought the content was fresh and interesting from uh, my own perspective. Um, you know, I obviously want to get work out of it. I'm still mm -hmm. a brand con and marketing consultant. I hope someone picks it up and says, wow, I really agree. Uh, and let's get this guy in there. So believe me, it's in some ways a thick brochure uh, that demonstrates my thinking. And um, being on shows like this uh, demonstrate that I'm always thinking about marketing and, and very yeah, appreciative for the opportunity. It's a glorified business card. I wrote a book about four, three or four years ago, and it is absolutely, I love the idea of handing over a book when everyone else is handing, when my competitors are handing over a business card when I'm looking for speaking <laughs> engagements. So uh, well done, Jeff. Uh, listeners, you can find out more about Jeff at swistoncommunications.com, S-W-Y-S-T-U-N, I think is the spelling. Have I got that right, Jeff? Perfect. Once Good on again. you, mate. Perfect. Uh, I'm sorry to hold you up. I'm sure there's a, a mountain to be skied, so I'll farewell <laughs> you and uh, all the best, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was absolutely a ton of fun. And once again, if any of your uh, listeners want to reach out to me, the meter's not always running. I just like to have interesting conversations, so please do reach out. Very giving. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you go, team. Jeff Swiston, author of a very cleverly titled book, why Marketing Works. I do love a marketing person, by the way, whose meter isn't always running. In fact, I love any service provider whose meter isn't always running. Thanks, Jeff, for making the time. And thanks to American Express. Here's the three principles that grabbed my attention the most from that chat with Jeff. Principle number one, use emotion to connect as quickly as possible with your prospects and customers. Love that. A great way to do that is to show that you understand the problems they have that your business, your product, your service, your brand can solve. Very simple way to show and use emotion. Uh, principle number two, I love the idea of building a community around your brand. You know, in an era where we're all looking down at a screen way too much, the idea of bringing people together excites the hell out of me. And here's a bit of an awkward conversation. I've been pretty hopeless at doing that over the last 10 years. Kind of would I really love the idea of just hiring out a big stadium. Don't know if I could fill it. Love to, but a big room anyway. Big stadium. That's over the top, Timo. Get a life. Uh, big room and just invite all you SBB Emmers in it for a day or two and um, have a bit of a marketing bash. Love to do that. Build a community. One day, got to find the energy for it. You know, anyone want to help? <laughs> and principle number three that I loved of Jeff's is build relationships. As Jeff said, we're all emotional beings looking for relevance, context, and connection. So building and nurturing those relationships in your business, whether it be with your staff, your customers, your suppliers, the media, partners, whatever it may be, would be a good idea. That's what grabbed my attention. Would love to know what grabbed yours. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 466 and leave a comment. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Oh, yes, indeed, Lee Doodly. It's time to reward another motivated listener for taking action. And today's winner is... Damien Caneva of Point Cook Physical, who, according to his website, doesn't just treat injuries, he prevents them. <laughs> now, here's what Damien had to say. He said, hey, Timbo. I've purchased and read almost all of the books from the authors you've mentioned on your podcast. Seth Godin, Gary Vaynerchuk, your mate Andrew Griffiths, Ryan Holiday, Dave Allen, and Simon Sinek would be the key standouts. What effect they have had and what effect you have had is a blurred line. But if I had to identify three main elements, I would say that my patients, my staff, and myself all have a much clearer understanding of of my business's brand. Well, that's a pretty good outcome, Damien. Thanks to you, I have developed a distinct respect for marketing, which has helped my business excel, 
Lastly, I know that amongst all the information I've gleaned from these books, I need to stay focused on direction, not perfection. Very, very true. You've heard me mention that a few times, Damien. It's probably some of those authors have as well. Thanks for all your work, Timbo. It's safe to say you've changed my life. For the better, of course, he puts in brackets. It's also safe to say you've changed a lot of people's lives for the better who've subsequently come into contact with my business. That's awesome. And while I'm at it, just the exposure to all the different businesses and products you have provided on your podcast has made my life better, like the Orbit Key, the iFly Flat Guy, the crazy marketing guy from Harvey Norman, etc., etc. Okay, got it. They're all past guests and they have an impact on Damien's work life. Love that. Keep up the good work, Timbo. Damien De, De Caniva of Point Cook Physical. Hey, Damien, just for sending that in, mate, you have won big. Here's what you've won. A $50 voucher from the beach people, a full range of liars, non-alcoholic spirits. That's valued at over 500 bucks. $50 sendal voucher, a $100 voucher to buy some tradies undies for you or your better half, a $50 voucher to buy some Sant and Abel PJs, you got a My DNA test kit valued at 99 bucks. These are all been donated from past guests of the show. How awesome is that? Two tickets to Cham Tang's digital marketing workshop, thanks to authentic education. You got some promotion on the show and a backlink in the show notes. What more can you ask for? That's worth over a thousand bucks all up of prizes. You want to enter everyone else? Do what Damien did? Send me an email. Tell me what's working for you in your business. An idea that you've learned from this show and have applied in your business and what outcome it's achieved. Just keep it to like 25 words? No, 100 words. 100 words is good. Email me, tim at timreid, R-E-I-D dot com dot au. If I read it out on this show, you win. Well, that about wraps up episode 466. <laughs> Clearly, click 66 of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thanks to our great mates at American Express. And you can check out their very sweet range of business cards by simply searching Amex Business. You can go and do that now if you like. Hey, don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. And you can also grab a copy of my popular marketing text, The Boomerang Effect. It's quite an author's show today with Simsy and, you know, Damien reading all the books from past guests and Jeff having written one. I'm going on. If you love the Small Business Big Marketing Show, then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone and downloading it for them. Until next week, I am Tim Bo Reed. Always have been, always will be. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now. <laughs>